It's a diner, it's a confectionery, and it's been a staple of the mountain town of Frostburg for generations. Today on People, Places, and Thingamajigs, we're going to stop by the Princess Restaurant for a very unique look behind the scenes during a very special time of the year. This is the Princess Restaurant in Frostburg, Maryland. Established by George Pappas Sr., it opened as a diner and confectionery in 1939, and now, 85 years later, it's still operated by the Pappas family. It's also still very much a diner with, dare I say, excellent food and extremely reasonable prices, and while it may not be confectionery per se year-round, come Easter time, the candy shop once again goes into full swing. While Lauren, who is the fourth generation of the Pappas family, has the helm of the diner, her dad, George, the third generation, makes his way down to the candy room. He's on his way to make candy the way his family has made candy since the early 1900s, completely by hand. So this is the fourth generation now of making candy. The restaurant here making candy is 85 years. We're 85 years since my grandfather came here, and they, he's made candy here 85 years ago. So before that, he made candy in Lona County, Maryland, mm -hmm. and that was like 1914, 15, 18. And not a lot has changed in that time. There are no machines to perform any of the work, and much of the equipment has been there since the beginning. Again, the surroundings is a little, you know, this is 1920. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Cleaned but up it's a not, Yeah, it's clean. It's, it's cleaned not, up it's a just, little bit. It's just old. It's just, yeah. this is it. So <laughs> this is what you get. You know, we're not trying to camouflage it or whatever. It is what it is. Yeah. But this also goes into the art of this whole thing. That people, when they buy that and they come in the door, don't understand. This mole here goes back to, I honestly don't know, but I always say World War I. Because... These old moles, you can see the condition of the metal. That's another one. These are two of the oldest ones we have and two moles that nobody in this area has. Nobody maybe in the state of Maryland has. You know, and if they are around, no one's using them. They're using them as antique. George and his helper produce more than 1,000 pounds of finished Easter candy in a season, which means he starts the process of making the candy in mid-January and continues making candy until the week before Easter. That's about 300 hours for George and about 250 hours for his helper to make, package, and label each individual piece of candy. The early start's also key because the outside temperature has a lot to do with the process. So we go back to, you know, the World War I years when they made candy similar to this almost the same way. We've only progressed since 1955 to present. We're the same since 1955. Mm -hmm. In the 30s and the 40s, there was a little more difficulty in making the candy. There was no cool, no air conditioning or anything like that. And we still don't use any air conditioning. Our air conditioning is we filter the air that comes through that window and push it with a fan. That's our high tech. Uh, climate control. George makes more than just rabbits for molds. There are trucks, trains, soccer balls, and, well, much more. But last, that portion of the Easter candy making season was over for this year. I was still curious about the process, though, and George was kind enough to explain. So this process, I'm telling you, is the days before machinery. There is no machinery here, yeah. you know. <laughs> okay, I mix the chocolate up by hand, get the right temperature, hand feed it to the mole, mm -hmm. tap it to take the air bubbles out. Again, there, even since the 50s to present, there's machinery you can buy that will do this for you. The difference between a machine-made rabbit, which is perfectly smooth, no air bubbles and everything, they have a high-tech equipment in today's world that can do that. Back at this day, if you want something handmade, it's not going to be 100% perfect. It's going to be real good, but there's going to be a little flaw somewhere. Yeah. You know, a little air bubble, a little, and, uh, and that's just the way it is. So, we take that from here, we take clean, clean freezer paper, put it on a wooden tray here, set it here in the area here, have the airflow coming in just right that you like. 
adjust the window to if it's too cold or too warm, and that's our high-tech airflow. <laughs> After 10, 15 minutes, no machinery, you have to turn the tray so the airflow hits it at a different angle. You do that in a process every 15, 20 minutes. Sometimes sooner, sometimes later. Once it starts setting up real good, you don't have to do it as much. But the other purpose of doing that is, those big rabbits and, and even the little ones, if the airflow hits that neck real cold, it's like a water line in the winter, you have a crack in the wall and the water line freezes right where the air comes through the crack. It's the same thing here. You hit that airflow, hits that rabbit at a certain place, it's going to get too cold before the bottom sets up, and that's what cracks the neck, the thin spark. So you keep rotating that around a while. This rabbit will take at least an hour and a half to set up. Maybe two hours. So what happens is, the time we make four or five trays of these rabbits, we keep pushing them away from the cold weather, the window, and first tray's ready to take out, the back trays aren't. So when you're ready to take it out, the rabbit's set up, and of course it's full of chocolate. You just pull the clamps, open it up, and the rabbit's gonna be sitting there. Tap the rabbit to break it from the mold. Sometimes you have to take the other mold, you know, set it down on the paper, the rabbit comes out, if you're lucky. Most of the time we're lucky. Well, that explains that. But the reality of it is, the molds, as they're called, are only a small portion of the business. The most popular type of candy is, no surprise, the Easter eggs. The day I visited, George was preparing to make a half batch, or about 17 pounds, of coconut eggs as their supply was running low. It turns out the coconut is one of the more popular flavors of Easter eggs, second only to, yep, you guessed it, peanut butter. To go back into the way I sized it up, you went into the 40s, the most popular egg was fruit nut. You went to the 50s, it was coconut. Once you passed 50s and went into the 60s, peanut butter was the most popular egg. Peanut butter is still the most popular egg. We probably make almost twice as much peanut butter as we do anything else. So coconut peanut butter is the two main ones. The other ones sell them, but they're not all that popular. Mm. Chocolate fudge in the last 10 years has gotten kind of popular. And last year we started uh, a fudge that is a caramel kind of fudge center with sea salt that's in the caramel dipped in chocolate. Take and roll this up into a ball and roll it out in small strips makes it a little easier to cut, but if you don't do this, this is too brittle. The sugar dries up. And once you break the sugar down again, it goes creamy. Back in dad and granddad's days, and when I was here in high school in the early 70s, we made quarter pound, half pound, pound, two pound, three pound, five pound. In today's world, we don't make an egg bigger than a pound. We want to cut them in ounce and a half pieces. And when we dip them, they'll come out two ounces. It's a good candy bar size type egg. Perfect for Easter baskets, perfect for individuals to just take one and eat it. The small eggs, which are only available in peanut butter and coconut, are the most popular. George and his helper will make about 6,000 of them this year. Every egg is rolled twice, once to size, and once again after it sets a short while to achieve the perfect egg shape. From there, they go to the dipping station to be dipped in either milk chocolate, dark chocolate, dark chocolate with sea salt, or my favorite, the house specialty, which is a secret blend of butterscotch and awesomeness. The house specialty is a flavor that is so popular it was the only thing put on peanut butter eggs until 1990, whenever they added milk chocolate and eventually dark chocolate. Okay, I have some warm chocolate and I threw some lumps in that was cold. 
And now I'm going to blend that in. That's going to make my big pot of chocolate a little colder because it's not real hot. And you start to feel the consistency, the thickness. Now, if people worry about the hand being in the chocolate, chocolate doesn't spread bacteria. It's not like dairy. Dairy's the worst, chocolate's one of the safest. Plus, your hand's supposed to be clean, but you can do it with a glove. But you don't get the real temperature effect. And I do it with a glove at certain times. But 99% of the time, it's this way. If you happen to nick your finger or something like that, then you got to use a glove. Some candy makers use gloves all the time, but when you're dealing with the sticky sugar and everything, you're constantly just screwing with gloves. For a while, you'll build up a little chocolate on the tray, and that helps temper the hot chocolate coming in because you're mixing the cold chocolate with the hot chocolate from the warmer and it helps cool this down a little bit. So you, this is what we always called working the chocolate, tempering the chocolate, and you get the consistency thick. As it gets cold, it gets thicker. You gotta get it at the right time. It gets too cold, you put a little warm chocolate in, you blend it back in and start the process over. So during a whole course of eggs, you do this about 50 times because you can't do too much at once because you can't dip them fast enough for the chocolate getting cold. We call this fanning the chocolate, letting the heat out that's there. It's like a mixer, mixing it up good. Spread it out and I put some lines like that. If it doesn't run on you, it's an indication that it's setting pretty good. You can write with it. It doesn't run. Chocolate's ready. So I usually give it a little G for Geo and we go. So we will know if I'm right in about five minutes. Okay, we put the egg in. There's different ways to dip eggs. This is my version. Picked it up from Dad. And... I use a spatula to help me get the egg out of the chocolate pool. Dad didn't. He used his finger. I like the spatula because if I got a miss spot or I got to spread some chocolate, I can do it real quickly with the spatula. Every little egg's got a pea on the top of it, and that's for the princess. And that's how we do it. Times change. George admits that the Easter candy business is a fraction of what it was when he first started working in a candy shop as a young lad, much less when his grandfather started making candy in the early 1900s. The price of chocolate continues to rise. It's harder and harder to find the high quality ingredients that George demands for his candies, and obviously it's a lot of long days and many hours of work. So I asked George, is it worth it? It's beyond that now. It's beyond that I can't, it's hard for me to give up the tradition of this, yeah. Because once we do, once we give it up, it's going to be done. I mean, at this scale, I don't see it happening. Just because the princess isn't making candy year-round doesn't mean the confectionery's on hold. Fourth-generation Pappas, Lauren, has put her twist on the family business with some special items that appear on the menu for limited times, like white chocolate raspberry French toast and, well, let's not forget the seasonal super shakes. But the princess isn't just about candy and sweets. It's about great homemade food, a family atmosphere, and a Frostburg tradition. So stop by for daily breakfast and lunch specials, sit in a Truman booth, and enjoy a trip back in time when personal touch matters. Find out more about the princess restaurant not to mention how you can pre-order your handmade Easter candy for next year by searching for Princess Restaurant Frostburg on Facebook. So you take a little dab of cold chocolate 
you dab it on the mole or the eye, and then you stick the eye on, and you have your decorations. Every one of those is hand done. Two eyeballs for each rabbit times a thousand rabbits. Mm, it's not pretty. <laughs>